Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. So today I'm delighted to be joined by Joyce, Joyce McGuire Pavo, on the show for the second time and uh, still a superstar. So looking forward to this conversation, Joyce. Oh, thank you so much. I don't know what kind of superstar I am, but thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to talk healing today as we're focusing pretty much on healing or all the episodes I'm trying to do. Uh, like, because it's one of those words that we bandy around, and I think everybody's got a slightly different meaning uh, to to healing. And so, what does what does it mean to to you, Joyce? Well, you know, I I don't know how succinct I can be, but basically, I think a lot of people think healing means you're going to be fixed. As a therapist, I, I feel like people come and they think healing means they're going to get rid of all their issues and they're going to be fixed. Everything's going to be fine. But that is not quite accurate because I think healing has more to do with coping. I think that people learn strategies and skills to manage their feelings their pain, their trauma, their wound, if you want to, all those languages that we use about ways that people are hurt, um, those don't go away. They happen to you. They're, the body keeps the score. They're in you. They're there. So they're not going to go away, but you can manage them in a way that gives you the ability to live a better life. And so I think healing has a lot to do with, you know, accepting some pain and some trauma and figuring out how to move around it and how to move with it and how to uh, not let it control you, how to uh, how to manage it, if you will. Yeah. So I wanted to just I should have done this before we started, but um, you'd spotted I'd spotted something on your your um, Facebook feed that I thought was really great, and it was a quote. Um, let me see if I can find it. It was by Gabor Mate, I yeah. think. Yeah, where is that one? Let's see, here it is. Yeah. It, uh, all of Western medicine is built on getting rid of pain, which is not the same as healing. Healing is actually the capacity to hold pain. And that's by uh, Gabor Mate. And I think um, I've always thought this to be true, and I've said it in many different ways, but I think he said it perfectly. That, uh, you know, medicine and, and uh, medication and different things are are really trying to get rid of pain. Pain is actually very useful. Pain tells you that something's wrong. Uh, you need to have uh, alerts when something is wrong. So pain does that. If, if you didn't feel certain pain, you wouldn't go and get the help you needed to have something excised or to take some medication that would ameliorate it. Um, but it's not going to get fixed. It's not going to get taken away. It's, it's you know, as he says, well, let me just look back here. Um, it's the capacity to hold pain. And that's what I think we need to do. We need to realize that, you know, we hold everything that's happened to us. And we either hold it in a way that intrudes on our lives and takes over our lives or we hold it in a way that it becomes a uh, part of the fabric and we can still do the things we need to do and live in the ways that we need to you know I think I I think I wrote this back to you on Facebook um I, I have six brothers and a sister in my birth family and um yesterday I went to visit one of my brothers he's the fourth brother um, and he is very active. He does yoga. He does sports. He walks 7,000 miles a day. He's very active. He's 70 years old, years old. 
and he um, had a hip replacement 23 years ago. And it was magical. He had played football in college and he, you know, had he, all of my brothers are like bionic. They've had yeah. shoulder replacements, hip replacements, knee replacements. So anyway, he had this hip replacement and he was uh, on Martha's Vineyard at the beach a couple of months ago and he was swimming and a wave came and hit him and somehow the the strength of this wave knocked his hip out and it wow. it it was terrible he almost drowned i mean it, luckily my nephew was nearby and he pulled him out um and he went right to the hospital so long story short they operated and replaced with a newer 23 years later there's even bigger and better replacement items so he had surgery and um and he was healing really well he was you know he was doing his yoga and he was doing his walking and he was he was walking his dog and he felt good and one day not too long ago he was walking and he stopped at a stoplight to cross the street and he wasn't even moving. He was standing still and the hip went and he fell down. And he couldn't get up. Wow. And so he went back to the hospital and he's having surgery again on the 21st. I tell you this story because he's an interesting guy. He, he tells me in text that he's a little disappointed in himself because he really doesn't like not being active and he's a little depressed. He doesn't admit that easily. So I ran over to visit him. I brought him some goodies and I brought him a book. He loves to read. And um, and I was visiting him and I said, you know, are, are you feeling a little down? I said, you know, your surgery's coming up and you'll, and he said, I don't trust it anymore. I don't trust the surgery because that didn't work. Um, but he said, I'm trying my best. And he was reading uh, Ramdas, And he said, um, there was something I liked that I read. And it said that everything happens to you. Everything that happens to you is your new curriculum. So this is the new curriculum of what you're supposed to be studying. So I'm trying to pay attention to myself as an immobile person who has to depend on other people to get me things and to do things. And I'm trying to learn that because that's my new lesson. And he said, I'm not good at it at all. So it's going to take a lot of work. But I thought that was so interesting. I like this idea that anything that happens to you is your curriculum. And you really have to figure out how to make sense of it, how to make meaning of it how to make it work into your life and how how you're going to be in the world with this new trauma or new difficulty or new uh, something that you're facing yeah so uh, i think you know uh, pain is that way also i mean his story is about pain but any kind of pain psychological pain uh emotional pain uh physical pain these are all things that, you know, we have to learn to live with to some extent. And there are things we can do in this day and age to ameliorate them, to help us to feel better. But the in, the foundational cause isn't going to disappear. Yeah. So it's about our relationship with our trauma, our relationship with our feelings. Yes. Yes. And it's about not pushing them away or numbing them or running away from them or fighting them. Yeah. As you were talking about the the wave, uh the, the wave landing on your um your your brother, it it, it reminded me, I, I think I mentioned this in another podcast a couple of weeks ago. Sorry, listeners, but it, it was uh, there was this when we were doing history, when we were kids, it was about 10, uh, the, there was this legendary king called King Kinyu, who I, I did this not very good because I'm not very good at art, but I, I had to, for homework, you had to draw a picture of King Kinyu. And this is the guy who 
was try it, it tried to hold back the wave, the waves uh-huh. with his hand. So I drew this picture of him, you know, in a little sitting on a throne with his hand out, trying to push back the wave. And that seems to me the perfect metaphor for the for the trauma thing, right? Trying to push pu- push it back. And of course, you've got no chance. No, no, no chance with it. No, What's you what? have to you have to develop the strategies and skills to go with the wave. And to, you know, I mean, there it, it, there's so much that we need to do to accept what's going on and move with it. We can't erase it. It's, it would be nice if we could. People try to erase it with alcohol and drugs and religion and all kinds of things. Um, but you really can't erase what's happened to you. You can only figure out what the strategies are to integrate it so that you don't lose yourself. Yeah. But uh, isn't the, you talked about acceptance. Isn't it about the relationship first and then the strategies come later, is it? Like, you can't, you yes. can't yeah. Yeah. We, it's, it's about having, it's about having an insight. It, it, it's about seeing something as a, as a curriculum, as a learning opportunity, rather than, I don't know, what other, uh, it's about being curious about the future rather than being stuck in, in the past. Well, I, I think you don't really grow if you become so fixated on that trauma or that pain or that situation um it, it keeps you from seeing everything else that's going on around you it keeps you from moving forward and you shouldn't i i think it's such a balance because you shouldn't ignore it completely um that doesn't get you anywhere if you pretend it isn't there that doesn't help um, and if you highly focus on it and on nothing else, that doesn't help. It, it, you know, what's important is to find the balance where you accept that this is there. And then you, you know, figure out how to work with it. You know, it becomes the fabric of who you are, uh, but it can't become, you know, a focal point. It if it does, you don't grow. You stay right there. Yeah. Uh, in, interesting um, that you mentioned Ra- Ramdas. So that's the book that you bought for your brother. Yeah. No, it isn't. That was something he was reading. It was something. That was something he was reading. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because uh, did I, I think Leon told me this? Um, so. Uh, Leon, listeners, you may remember has been on a, a, a an interview on the podcast a, a few months ago. I'll put a link in there. I'll put a link in the show notes for that uh, because Joyce kindly introduced me to, to Leon, Leon a, a fellow Brit, a uh, fellow Brit adoptee. Um, he, he said to me that you did you did you used to study with Ram Das? Was he one of your contemporaries or something? I didn't study with him. I was I was at Harvard around that time, but I I hung out with him. We were friends, and uh, friends of mine lived in a house with him. They had a big communal house, and so I would go to dinners. I think Leon liked the story about the time I had dinner with Timothy Leary, Ram Dass, and the Dalai Lama. It 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 could be a movie, but. Um, but or yes, a joke. I, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or a joke. Um, I did uh, know Ramdas, and um, you know, it, it's funny if you if you live in certain places, you just cross paths with so many people, and Cambridge is like that. And I think there are lots of places in the world that are like that. Well, what I'm getting to is that uh, that's pretty cool. First off, you know, when <laughs> when Leon and. And it brings me to the kind of uh, I don't and I haven't really got the question 
yeah, but it seems to me that if if we categorize people like Ram Das as being spiritual guys rather than psychological guys, it 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 seems to me that the the bigger part of healing within adoptees that I talk to, the spiritual bit seems to be outshade the um the the psychological somehow. And I was going to say Trump. I was going to say that spirit the spiritual side trumps the psychological <laughs> side, right? But um we we, we wouldn't want to we don't use that, right? So <laughs> no. I, I I yeah I've someone somehow I've been looking for a word to use well, instead I, I... of that. So outshade uh, outshade. So would you to what extent would you uh, uh, uh agree with that? Absolutely. I I think if you spend time in your head if you're, you know, examining things, you at some point go beyond that. You know, it's I think there's definitely uh and it's important to define spirituality in a different way than religion i saw i'm gonna send you a funny little meme that i uh, it doesn't have any words on oh maybe it does have a couple of words on it but it, it's lovely it's uh, on the left hand side is a notion with a fishbowl and a fish in it and on the right side is the ocean with just a fish and the the fishbowl side says religion, and the other side says spirituality. Right. So you're you're in a a container when you're in religion, and you're you're not when you're into your spirituality. Yeah. So I I do think there's a connection certainly, um, and certainly many of the early psychoanalysts and psychologists had interests in various religions. Um, you know, I, I think it's most important for people to explore. I like this idea that, and Ramdas would have said this, of course, that it is a curriculum, that you are whatever whatever is going on. It's like when you're meditating, you just you focus on nothing or if something comes up, you go with that. You know, it's you, you, you move in the direction of what's placed in front of you. Yeah. But the most important thing is that you move. I think in therapy um, and especially in family therapy, the worst situations. And right now I'm working with a number of families who are having crisis after crisis and um, they're stuck. They're stuck doing the same thing over and over and not moving. They get into the same fights. They do the same thing. They, you know, being stuck is a curse. You have to move. You, you can't just stay still. And that's what happens when people focus on healing so intensely that they're not really healing. Yeah. So how would you how would you sum up that that difference between psychology and um spirituality? Bear in mind we're not as you say we're not talking about religion. We uh, it, well I I it, I would say I I would say instead of you know, another word, a synonym for spirituality would be consciousness. Yeah. Or or, yeah. or or awareness. Yeah. Why why is this a big deal compared to or you know, what's yeah, why why is this a big deal as opposed to psychology? Well, I think it's integrated somehow. And I think that, you know, I know when I'm working with individuals in therapy. One of the things, especially if there's someone who's a little skeptical of therapy, um, you know, what I often do is say, you know, basically, you're taking a course on yourself. We're going to be studying you. 
And, um, and, and, you know, when you study, you go to places that you wouldn't have gone before. You learn new things. You, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. And all of this is going on. Um, so I think it's important to realize that there's an interface between this kind of consciousness, awareness of yourself um, and yourself as a, as we might describe as spiritual. And it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to look like what some people might describe as spiritual. It, it really is seeing yourself as very important because you're here to do something, to be something. And so it's very important when, when people say, we have so many people using the word narcissist these days. I, I get very upset with the number of people who think they can, you know, diagnose someone because they've looked it up on Google and they, they think someone's a narcissist. Well, the news is that we all carry all of these definitions. Um, you have to be a little bit of a narcissist. The problem is when it's overblown and you're hurting other people, it's not a good thing. Um, but narcissism itself is, you know, you need to be selfish. If you're not paying attention to yourself, I, I like the airline thing of, you know, if we get into terrible turbulence, uh, put your own mask on before you put the child's mask on. Um, I think we, we need to pay attention to that. You really have to, you're not going to be able to help yourself or anyone else if you don't help yourself. So there is a, a bit of attention to self that's very, very important. Now it can go too far. You can become so involved in yourself that you don't pay any attention to anyone else. And that's that's not useful. But there is, in all of this, there's a balance. It's important to find the balance. Yeah. What's coming to, to my mind as uh, is when I say the word awareness, I, I'm, I'm talking about uh, us being awareness. That, that is who we are. So we are, we are for example, we are are not a thought we are not our thoughts um we are what's aware of those thoughts we are not our feelings we are aware of, we are the one that's aware of those feelings and we are not our trauma we are the ones that are aware of the trauma so given that i i kind of see our our identity as awareness that's that's how I kind of look at this stuff. So I'm, 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 I'm more interested in who I am, you know, that, that space, that awareness in which the feelings occur rather than the feelings themselves. And so I, I would have like spirituality or awareness or consciousness is a big deal to me because I think that studying that is more powerful than studying our, our our thoughts and feelings and that's kind of my experience and so for for where i thought that nancy verio's book kind of is a good description of 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 trauma her follow up book was about five times thicker and all about psychology she didn't go anywhere near consciousness or awareness as the um, as the bigger driver of our healing uh, on the basis of what i've heard from fellow adoptees uh -huh. Well, it, that takes us back to that quote by Gabor um, about what medicine, I mean, you know, there's a medical model 
that really does look for something wrong. You don't look for what's right. If you, when you go to the doctor, they're not looking for, you know, how you're doing in a most positive way. And, you know, you're going because you're looking for what's wrong so you can fix it. Um, so the, the thing is the awareness it's, you need to, the thoughts and feelings are important because not everyone gets to awareness just by taking a leap. People need to go through some process and each person's process is different. Um, but I do think that, um, as you described Nancy's books, the second one was very medical model. I mean, you know, it really, and that's, Unfortunate because my whole thing, I've spent my entire professional life trying to depathologize adoption, which is a little difficult because I'm not trying to say that we don't have trauma. And I'm not trying to say that adoption is done horribly and that it has had a devastating effect on people and that there are some things about it that should just be slashed and done away with. Um, but there are also some things that we need to think about. And, you know, I think that's that's what we need to do is to pay attention to what's wrong and what's right and not to pathologize the people, but to pathologize the system. And that, that's what uh, listeners, if you want to more on, if you want to listen to more on, on this, I mean, the the, uh, the depathologizing of us as adoptees is, is where, where um, Joyce started off the last uh, conversation that we had. So as well as the link to, to Leon's uh, interview, I'm going to put a link to uh, Joyce's first interview, obviously, in the show notes for this, so, so you can understand more about the, the pathologizing. So th it, this, if we go back to the, the, the Ramdas and the curriculum piece and the learning piece, one of the biggest drivers would seem to me is uh, if we're wanting to heal, it it would seem to be around openness to new ideas and uh, genuine cur curiosity um, because we're holding uh, and, and hold it maybe holding our our personal theories and, and our beliefs a little bit lighter so not being kind of grasping onto them You know, I also, I, I, it's fascinating to me that back in the day, in the 60s and 70s, when uh, Ram Dass and uh, McClelland and uh, all of those professors were doing all their work with LSD and other kinds of uh, interesting materials, and, and they were getting somewhere. They were doing some very interesting work but it got it got misused people were playing with it and it was you know there were lots of issues and it was clamped down on and i find it interesting that harvard medical school just had a conference on psychedelics and mushrooms and you know using all of these alternative uh you know they're getting back to where they left off 50 something years ago um, and and a lot of adoptees are doing, you know, interesting trips, so to speak, and trying to figure themselves out in various ways. And, you know, as long as you have good guides and appropriate support, and I'm not against the medical profession, I think we need to be safe and to make sure we're not doing anything dangerous. Um, but I do think these are ways of exploring ourselves and exploring the ways that that we deal with things. Um, it's, you know, I have two really wonderful clients who have been in such deep depression on the on the precipice of suicide several times, 
who have had ketamine uh, treatments uh, under medical surveillance and, um, and it basically saved their lives. And they're doing amazing work, internal work, and they're, they're in the world in a way that they weren't able to be. So I think it's important that we see all of the possibilities and no medication or substance or anything works by itself. You have to do the work that goes with it. So having having people who know what they're doing guide you, having, you know, your therapist or, you know, doing all of the work can certainly make a difference. But these are all different. There are so many different ways that people can find the the pathway to what we would call healing. That doesn't mean you're giving up the scars or the the initial wound it means you're incorporating it you're learning to live with it you're moving through it you're not you're not being bowled over but you're not trying to keep it back with a hand yeah. you're trying to weave it into who you are and accept it so i want to pull together a couple of things that you've said with some other stuff that i've heard and um and, and run that by you, see if it kind of see if it makes sense. So what I've what I've heard about the um, the, the use of these um, uh, materials is that it it slows it slows the brain down. You've got less. You've kind of got you've got less on your mind, and therefore you've got uh, n- new ideas will come to you. Wisdom, new wisdom will come to you. And so it, it, it's almost as if we, we talked about earlier on, you talked about focusing on focusing on, 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 on our problems, focusing on our trauma and, and hold, holding on to that tight um, keeps it in place, whereas being more open, holding it more lightly, finding more balance helps us helps us heal so that what we're talking about here is that these substance sorry listeners i uh, in 420 episodes of doing these podcasts that has never happened to me before i just got cut off so um we were talking joyce uh, joyce is reminding me what we're talking about um so there the the what the thing I've heard is that basically these uh, these substances slow our brains down so we have space for new wisdom uh, and and in in so doing right they they are a form of catalyst a way for us to switch our overthinking minds off and be open to new possibilities open to changing our beliefs about who we are, changing our beliefs about our trauma um, and, and changing uh, changing our world for the better. That's kind of what I've heard about the substances. I think that's true. And I also think that's not the only way to get there. I mean, the reason that mindfulness and meditation and yoga have been so integrated into trauma work is because all of these things do the same thing and not everyone gets the satisfaction from one or the other of these modalities so for some people they may need to or want to try a substance but you know and for some people meditation is very hard to to calm themselves down uh, you know, who knows, their their body may take more to calm down and to get to the place yes. where they can focus. But there are I, I, I wouldn't want people to think that you could only get to this space by doing mushrooms or by yeah. doing, you know, MDMA or whatever. I think that there are many different pathways where you can bring your thinking to a place where... Um, 
where you can let things in, you can let, you know, an awareness of what's around you and what's happening to you. And you can see things differently so that you can make different choices. Yeah. So what we're saying, I think, is that there are many paths to that openness. Yes. So uh, Joyce and I are both dog lovers. So walking in nature, right, having some peace and quiet and time to ourselves and just listening to the birds tweet and doing that sort of stuff, that is one route to kind of calm ourselves down. So I'm thinking now uh, about... Um, uh, 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 something that happened at the start of lockdown, right? So I was having a basically a 55 year old's tantrum, or however I walked at that time. I was having a little bit, a little bit of a tantrum, and uh, and a, a, and so and I was in danger of really cheesing off my wife. So something told me in that moment people call it wisdom i thought i've got to get out of here i went off and i took myself to walk walk the dog calm down and come back and 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 i got to a solution that i wouldn't have got to before so nature meditation listening to a podcast all these materials uh, these substances that we're talking about um or mindfulness the these are all routes to to a, a, a an expanded version of ourselves uh, a more open version of ourselves a place where we're more likely to have new ideas that are uh, see things afresh and solve new stuff and I'm sure there are so many more, Simon. You mentioned that we both love dogs. And um, I ran a clinic for 20-something years. And it was a clinic for adoption and foster care and kinship care. And uh, one of the uh, board members gave us a therapy dog. And, um, and, that, and in the process of doing that, I read everything I could about um, therapy dogs and about, you know, well, I read everything about therapy animals, but I was specifically looking at the dogs. And, um, you know, there's some amazing research about how being with a pet um, just brings your blood pressure down and it slows you down, your, your system slows down immediately. And um, so there are so many different ways that we can get to a place where we're more open and more available to see things a different way and to move in a different direction. And moving is what's most important. Um, it doesn't have to be fast moving. It can be slow moving, but not to be stuck, not to be stuck. Yeah. And not to be stuck in the trauma not to be stuck in that exactly. why did this happened to me yeah um, and and blaming blaming the world so in that moment you know like i i when i was having the tantrum i was i was blaming the world not and you know I, there's something i want to say about this cuz a lot of people get very upset and you, you and I, we talked about this a little bit about people who think uh, we need to get angry. We need to get, we need to get into the problems here. And, um, you know, we're not doing our work politically if we're not talking about how bad um, this is and what the results have been to so many people. Um, and I, I don't disagree with that at all. And I think there are stages of development in everything. And um, I, I think when you're going through the process of whatever you call it, you might call it coming out of the fog, you might call it uh, having more of an awareness, uh, it can have any label anyone wants to give it. But when you get to a cer certain point, and you're exploring your situ situation in a different way, 
there is a tendency to go through the stages of grief and loss and to become very angry and to become, you know, I mean, there are really people who become furious at everything. There's nothing wrong with going through those stages. What's wrong is if you stay in that stage for 10 years, um, it's that you're missing 10 years of your life. You need to go through those stages. As a birth mother, you need to go through the stages of realizing how shut down you've been. Uh, you know, you haven't been able to deal with your feelings or grief because you were moved right along. Um, for everyone with their loss in adoption, but most especially for adoptees, it's really okay to go through the stages. The problem is if the stage becomes your whole self and your whole focus, it's not really fair to the rest of you, the rest of yourself, not the rest of you, the big you. Um, you know, you're not giving yourself the expansion and the ability to live the life that you might live if you were able to move through that in some way. Yeah. So what do you think gets in the way? Um, what what hinders our healing? Well, way? I think one of the things, I mean, there's so many things and we could make lists and we should maybe. But I think one of the things is that people don't hear us. Uh, people don't see us. People don't acknowledge us. Um, the, the more you're not seen and heard and acknowledged, the more you buckle down and get stuck um, because you're trying to make this point and, and no one seems to understand. No one seems to get this. Um, so I think it's really important what, what Bruce Perry, who's one of my favorite uh, trauma guys, what he says, it's very simple, but very important, is what's shareable is bearable. So to be able to share on a podcast, to be able to share on a group uh, on Facebook or, you know, on a, on a uh, Zoom uh, class that you take or whatever, when you have other people to share things with and they're acknowledging you and seeing you, there's a way that you can slow down and you can let go of some of that anger and you can move in another direction. Um, but as long as the other people are stuck in not responding to you, the the harder it is to turn your wheels. You're like spinning your wheels in mud. Yeah. I touched on this on another podcast recently. I'm not sure which one it was. Um, but I think we got to a, we got to a, a, a distinction between external barriers such as other people and internal barriers. So stuff, barriers that are within mm -hmm. uh, our, uh, are, are within ourselves. So, I think that lack of validation from others or lack of even attention I think, mm -hmm. um, is, is a, a very, a very big external barrier. And I can see where I have spiraled and gone round and round and bang, you know, banging my head against the brick wall rather than, uh, and yeah, rather than moving, going through the doorway um what about the internal what about the internal barriers or well I, do any do ever do any other external barriers come to mind what internal barriers come to mind how I'd, i'll leave it up to you how you handle it. well no i think we've been talking about them during this this time i i mean i think that you know really giving yourself the opportunity to realize that you can't change what was done to you, what happened to you, what, you know, what the circumstances were, 
Um, and you don't want to just accept them and say, oh, well, that's fine. It ended up okay. I'm all right. Um, somewhere in the middle is the acknowledgement that something is wrong, that there's a trauma, there's a loss, there's multiple traumas, there's multiple losses. And um, how are we going to how are we going to value those losses and acknowledge them without making them the emblem? You know, it's, it's really important. You're a sum of all your parts. You're not just one thing. And so the, the, the more we make the trauma, this huge thing, the more we diminish ourselves. Yeah. And they and you know, adoptees are magical. I I loved BJ Lifton was always fun to be around because she she loved children's stories and she loved myths and fairy tales and she uh, she would tell stories and you know there is something magical about the story. She always she always talked about you know, the foundling and the orphan and, you know, in all the stories and all the Bible stories, myths and fairy tales, we're the center of the story. There's, you know, it's really based on us. So we, we hold a great deal of power in literature, in spirituality, in religion, and, you know, but how to get to that power within ourselves, how to, how to not limit the potential to be everything we could be and not to be just stuck in the mire, you know? I, it's it's not fair. It's not fair to us. It's not fair that it's been done to us and it's not fair that we're doing it to ourselves. Yeah. I, one of the things that you just said then kind of reminded me about something that, I've seen fairly recently and that's the extent to which I've been doing a kind of uh, what do they call it they call, call it a spiritual bypass yeah so yeah. so so it, it it's um underestimating essentially uh, un, un, underestimating the impact and and being um what's the word uh Billy being a bit poly Pollyanna-ish about this. Can can you talk about that? Because I, I haven't really got better words for it. I'm sure you'll go to wrap it up. I don't know how I, I think it's it's such a good, you know, it's using the medical model, the sort of uh cardiac bypass that we have this is a different kind of bypass but it it is i think those are good analogies to think about how how you can reroute certain things you're you're you know you still have the problem and you've got a new solution uh and it's it's something and it, i don't think it's the same for everyone at all so the reason this is so hard to talk about, Simon, is that it's not, I find, you know, with myself and with my friends and colleagues and certainly with my clients, that everyone has a very different path and a different route and, and different strategies and different specialties, different, um, I, I think it's it, it's hard to talk about because there are so many different routes and paths and ways to do what we need to do. I think the most important thing and the most generalized thing to say is that to have an awareness that this is going on, uh, sometimes you're so stuck you can't see the forest for the trees. Well, you know, there's a forest and we need to look at the big picture. We need to look at what's going on. And then we need to do the micro work on ourselves and, and to see how we can be in this situation and do the best job we can 
to live a life that isn't stunted by this terrible thing that's happened. Yeah. So we've got to find our own kind of path through. Absolutely. The Absolutely. And I don't like it when people, I mean, I think people make an industry out of, uh, you know, whenever there's a new technique or a new this or a new that, it becomes the thing. And and I, I, I sort of don't feel like that's useful because nothing works for everyone. And what's more important is to understand that all of this is going on and there are different ways to address it. And part of the Holy Grail, the search for your Holy Grail is figuring out what that is. What's your way to get to this? It's it's not going to be the same way that I have or that someone else has. It's it's really knowing that that you have some work to do. And other people can give you clues. You can get treasure maps. You can get all kinds of things from other people. Um, but basically, you need to be very involved. Yeah. What have, what have been your most significant healing moments? Hmm. Excellent question. Um, you know, I think it's, it takes a lot, uh, but letting go, letting go really does lead to healing. It's, it's very hard to let go of some things that are, you know, that feel so vital to you, but letting go of them is very freeing like letting go of um I, I was pretty fortunate in that i found my birth family and it was very positive and i had a good adoptive family um but i you know there are certain things there are people who have really disappointed me and hurt me and uh you know being unable for a while to see that they would do this um and then to be able to let go to just let go you know i i think that those those are things that really do heal yeah it also you know a big healing part and i mentioned this you know finding my birth family and uh finding my new place you miss all the space you weren't in with them up until when you find them um and so it's very hard for adoptees because you belong in both families and you belong in neither family um there's part of you that never quite belonged in your adoptive family and there's part of you that will never quite belong in your birth family and so I think, you know, that can be tricky, but it there is a very healing spot in realizing that and taking what you can from both places yeah. and integrating it. So it's like a seeing thing when when you realize that for yourself. Yes. Yeah you stop trying to force it i mean what did you, what happened right i i think there's a lot of magical thinking that once you do this this will happen or that you know this will fix everything um and it, it doesn't but it does something and if you can see what it is doing instead of fixating on what it isn't doing that's so much more healthy yeah, could could you give us a a practical example or a, yeah an example of that? I'm a I'm an example guy rather than a theory guy. I don't know. I think I the one I gave you is the one that comes closest. Yeah. That you know, feeling like if you search, <coughs> you 
your your birth family is going to be like you. They're going to understand you. They're going to really know you uh, in a way that you were never known or that you weren't in a real family when you were in a family that wasn't genetically connected to you. And you don't ever fully belong. And you, you, you missed your place in your birth family. You didn't grow up with your siblings. You aren't, there's a difference and so it's a different way of belonging. And you didn't belong in your birth family in certain ways. And, um, you know, you tried to, but you couldn't. You weren't genetically connected. So I think coming to the place where you're not trying to make everything something that it isn't, it, 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 to really integrate and integration is a really good word for all of this because I think really weaving things together and integrating uh, the past with the present gives you the the ability to have a future. Yeah, that feels like a good place to to bring it in, Joyce. It does. It does. Yeah, the future. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It's always great to talk to you, Simon. You take care of yourself and have a great holiday. Yeah, you too, Just. And, and you too, listeners. And go squiggle those puppies for me. I will do. Okay. Love to Oscar. Oscar Wilde is, is Joyce. Yes, yes. Thanks, Speak listeners. Speak to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.